Welcome to Conversations with Modern Stoicism. This is our very first time we've ever done this call, and I'm excited to have you part of this here. And of course, we've got Dr. John Sellers here with us to present with us today. So, you know, I thought since A, reach around, do this little thing, pat yourself on the back. Thank you for being here for the very first one of these. You're going to tell your kids I was here for the very first Conversations with Modern Stoicism. And let me talk a, little, a minute or two. First off, thank you all for being here. And I see your smiling faces. That we kind of, I'm leaving it up in gallery view so I can see you showing up on the call. So, you know, I want to see you. I want to get some feedback. I want you to be participants. And, you know, we, I'm not going to do a long intro for me, a very quick intro, right? So my thing at Modern Stoicism, I got involved with one of the, with the Stoicon. And it was when we made the transition from doing them in person and doing them uh, online. And this has been my connection to Modern Stoicism. And I am delighted that I can be part of this and help you. But one of the things that I've noticed is we do a lot of us talking to you, that is the modern stoicism team, talking to the audience, and not a lot of the audience talking to each other. So I have had this idea that maybe we could do a regular event where we actually got to talk to each other. And I went and talked to John Sellers about it and some other folks, and they said, you know what? Hey, I'm all for this. Let's give it, let's give it a go. And so this is why we're here. So the idea is let's have a place where we talk a little bit to you, set up a conversation, and then we get to talk to each other as well. So that's the why we're here, what we're going to do, what this is going to be like. So a thing is we're going to use the breakout room feature in this. So listen, I know when modern stoicism shows up, there's a bunch of smart guys. That's not me. That's everybody else. But all the smart guys that they talk and we kind of lean back and listen. But in this event, we're going to lean forward and talk to each other. Um, what's the agenda for this event? So we're going to do this introductions. This is the thing that we're doing right now. We're going to have a short presentation from Dr. John Sellers. Then we're going to do a group Q&A. By the way, the way the group Q&A is going to work is I'm going to ask you to put stuff inside the chat when we get to that bit. And then we're going to and I'll ask some questions of John. And then I'm going to give you some instructions on how we do this thing with breakout rooms and drop you into breakout rooms in small groups so that you can chat with each other and talk a little bit about that. So let's go ahead and start with where in the world are you and stick that in the chat. So where in the world are you? So I'm just going to read a few of these. Ontario, Canada, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I see folks in London. Of course, John's with us in London, Toronto, Canada. I am in beautiful Greenville, South Carolina. I see my buddy Ken is up in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I haven't really scanned the screen yet to see who all know. I see Stoic Dan's here with us. I got to see Dan when we went and did the live event down in Tampa a few weeks back. So that was awesome. All right. So... Your fingers work. That's good. You're part of this already, right? You're part of the tribe. Hey, John Sellers. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I guess you can see me and hear me. I can see and hear you. That's You're it. doing well in London, I presume? I'm in I'm in Oxford, but yes, I'm doing good. Oh, okay. Excellent. So, by the way, when we ask you about your favorite, and I'm going to say English version of the meditations, where do you where do you go to? Yeah, so, I mean, the first version that I read, it was the old Penguin one by Maxwell Staniforth. And so I have a soft spot for that one simply because it's the first one I read. And, and I still think it's pretty good. I think it's got a nice style and I think it's accurate. And obviously, since then, loads have come along. And I have to say, I do think Robin Waterfield's very recent one is really good. And I wrote a blurb for it where I said it was brilliant and I meant it, right? Some people yeah. write book blurbs and you don't know if this is just puff. But, you know, I I try to be fairly honest. If, I, if I'm if i given a book and I don't like it, I just won't write anything. But I, <laughs> Robin, I said it was excellent and I meant it. I think he's a really accomplished translator and he really knows his ancient philosophy. So the introduction, the notes are all really helpful. Yeah, I, I I agree. And of course, I don't bring to it the, the academic rigor that you do. But oh my gosh, it's just 
the notes are wonderful and I just love it. And of course, we were lucky enough to have him on one of the modern stoicism events and talking about that and his translation and so forth. And I got to ask him a few questions myself. But I love what you just said there because I'm the same way. You know, I've done, I've written, written lots of reviews, not in style of stoicism, but for technical stuff. And if I don't like it, I'll just say, eh, I'm not, I'm going to pass on this one. But if I do like it, then I'm happy to give a full throated voice to what it is I thought was going on and what I, why I like what was going on. So very good. John, what are you going to talk about today? Okay, so <clears throat> I, so something I've been thinking about for a while recently is a certain tension in how we think about stoicism and its attitude towards external possessions, wealth, things like that. And, and so I just want to kind of sort of talk through what I've been thinking about on, on this issue. I've literally in the last hour or so thrown together a few rough and ready slides. So if it's okay with you, I'll share my screen and I'll rattle through some of these slides. There are a couple of points where it gets a bit technical. And so I'm going to kind of apologize in advance that it might be, it might seem a bit too scholarly for this audience. But I think the point I want to make is one that is really important and really practical and is one that is one that has big implications for how we think about what it might mean to live a stoic life. Well, I trust you implicitly. How about let's go ahead and get your slides up and I'm going to do a quick intro of you just in case anybody doesn't know who you are. Well, let's get your slides going first. And when that's, is that you? Yep, yeah, I'm viewing John Seller's screen. So that must be right. When I was putting this event together, I had in my mind, the very first person we should have speak and present is John Sellers. And so I wrote a little bit about why I thought John was the right person. And it's not your actual intro, but I think I'm going to read what I said about you in case no one read it. And then I'm going to ask you to do one thing first before you jump into your bit. Just introduce folks to the modern stoicism group. I mean, I could do this, but for a second, just tell people about the organization, Modern Stoicism, since you were one of the founding folks. But let me introduce John Sellers first, and then I'm going to jump off the stage. John said, <laughs> this is what I wrote, John Sellers' work on Marcus Aurelius is a valuable contribution to the study of ancient philosophy. His scholarship is rigorous and his writing is clear and engaging. His work provides a valuable insight into the thought of one of the most important philosophers of the Roman Empire. Now, here's the deal. He knows a lot more than that, and it's a lot deeper than that. But he is the right cat to get us started in this conversation. So he is going to tell us a little bit about modern stoicism and then give us a quick presentation. Thanks, Phil, for the kind words. So, yeah, let me say a little bit about modern stoicism. So <clears throat> we're a, a group of a group of people, some academics, some psychotherapists, some other interested persons who came together initially just over a decade ago with the idea of whether we could test stoicism to see if it might be helpful for people. And it was that idea of trying to test stoicism to see if it actually benefits that led us to come up with the idea of Stoic Week. And we've been running that for over a decade in now. We've gathered all sorts of information. And I think we're all pretty damn confident that stoicism does indeed help people on the basis of the information that we've gathered. So by this point, we're not really trying to test whether stoicism helps people or not. We're pretty confident we, we know that. And there have been a number of proper academic studies published in the last few years that also seem to confirm that. Now that we're, we're confident of, of that, we, we, are, we are just keen to kind of share the benefits that stoicism can bring to as wide an audience as possible. And so that's what we're continuing to do. Okay, so I mean let me let me crack on with this. As I say, this isn't this isn't scripted or anything. It's just a few thoughts. I'm not going to talk a huge amount about Marcus Aurelius, but I'm going to start with Marcus Aurelius. Here's a picture from Donald Robinson's graphic novel about Marcus. Right. So Marcus Aurelius obviously was in a came from a privileged background, a very wealthy background, not quite born to become emperor, but close enough to the imperial family to be noticed and spotted and then adopted into the imperial family. And yet we're told that as a child, he turned his back on the life of luxury that he benefited from and wanted to live a very simple life. I mean, the ancient sources say that he adopted the philosopher's cloak, which is to say that he was happy to wear fairly rough and cheap 
clothes rather than the more fancy things he could have worn. And so this picture is Marcus's mother coming in. You know, you've gone too far. I want you to read the Greek philosophers, not to try to live like them. You're a Roman noble, not Diogenes the cynic begging in the street. Right. And so it's this introduces a couple of things that I want to talk about. One, our kind of attitude to external possessions, wealth, luxury, those sorts of things. But also here in particular, it mentions Diogenes the cynic. How far should we renounce possessions? How far should we engage in what we might call voluntary poverty? And that's really the topic I want to kind of just introduce. So what's the stoic, what's the proper stoic attitude to wealth and possessions and these sorts of things? And on one view, like the young Marcus Aurelius, these seem to be things that we might think ought to be distrusted or avoided in some way. We renounce these things. We try to live a simple life. We try to make ourselves resistant to the challenges of fate and fortune by reducing our needs to a minimum. Or we become slightly suspicious of these things because we think that they might lead us down the wrong path. So that's one kind of view. On another view, we're, we're told that there were some Stoics, in antiquity at least, who had no problem at all with amassing quite considerable wealth and enjoying quite a nice life of luxury. Of course, Marcus Aurelius did later on when he was emperor, at least at certain points in his life. And Seneca, of course, is famed for being fabulously wealthy. So these look like two potentially contradictory ways in which we might think about what a Stoic attitude to wealth is. Now, of course, Seneca's often been criticised for the fact that he was fabulously wealthy. He's often been attacked as a hypocrite, right? You claim to be a Stoic, and yet you've got all of this money, you benefit from all of this. So I suppose another thought in the back of my mind is, was Seneca really hypocritical for being so wealthy? That, That is another kind of issue floating around here. And again, I think we can see this kind of distinction come up in what we might call the modern Stoic scene. I mean, as many of you will know, the kind of the the modern Stoic scene is fairly broad. You've got all sorts of different groups. You've got people interested in environmentalism and sustainability. You've got people making connections with Buddhism and mindfulness. You've got people in Silicon Valley who are interested in resilience and toughness. You've got people in the military. You've got all sorts of different groups groups of people out there coming with very different perspectives, all drawing on Stoic ideas. And it seems to me that within the kind of current sort of modern Stoic scene, you certainly find people that want to embrace what we might call voluntary poverty and choose to go without luxuries and live a simple life, right? And again, I think that seems like a perfectly you know, reasonable move. But at the same time, we've got other people out there particularly, say, people within a business context who have no problem whatsoever with amassing wealth, external possessions and so on and so forth, and certainly don't want to engage in that kind of voluntary poverty. Right. So I think we see potentially different attitudes amongst ancient Stoics and also different attitudes amongst people today who are trying to revive Stoic ideas. And so, you know, what's what's the proper Stoic attitude? Um, I'm going to characterize this as Seneca versus Epictetus, right? So Seneca is the rich guy who has no problem in amassing a certain amount of wealth and enjoying luxuries. He sometimes talks about living a simple life, but he certainly is quite comfortable in enjoying the finer things of life, right? Versus Epictetus, who seems to be far more austere and seems to renounce these things and seems to be suggesting that we live a far simpler life. And I think within the kind of modern Stoic scene, in fact, it's Epictetus that's often the greater influence. It seems to be he is often the point of reference. I mean, in all of the discussions about Stoicism and and cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, it's Epictetus who's the key point of reference for those people. In, in, In Massimo Pigliucci's books, he often turns to Epictetus in particular, and he talks about the three areas of study and so on and so forth. So I think Epictetus has been a stronger, stronger influence on the modern Stoic scene than, than Seneca has, although you know, Seneca has a few fans as well. Now, I mean, one way to think about all of this is to think about the idea of 
indifference. So pos- external possessions and wealth and all of these things are, for the Stoics, indifference, right? Now, that suggests to me that these are things we ought to simply be indifferent about, right? Not things that we ought to resist or avoid or be suspicious about or or think are potentially dangerous, right? So you might think that the attitude ought to be kind of easy come, easy go. If I've got money, then I'll enjoy it while I can. If I don't, then I don't. Whatever the situation might be, I'll deal with the situation I face myself, that I that I find myself in, right? But that doesn't seem to suggest that we ought to be suspicious of this kind of external good fortune and when we, when we have it, right? But the Stoics go further than that. They don't just say these things are indifferent and not things to be avoided. They say that these things are preferred. They say that these things that we should actively choose, they're things that we should pursue, all other things being equal, right? And the all other things being equal bit means so long as it doesn't compromise our, our virtues, right? So the kind of standard Stoic view seems to be that it's quite natural and normal for us to want to pursue these things. Of course, we'd all rather be wealthy than poor, right? That seems like a perfectly natural thing. And and why? Because it enables us to flourish and to live a good life and to look after our loved ones and all those other things. But Epictetus, his very kind of austere version of Stoic ethics barely mentions this key doctrine, right? Epictetus rarely mentions indifference. His position, I think, is much closer to the kind of cynic view. And Epictetus writes at length about Diogenes the Cynic as a kind of a role model, right? If you really want to be a good, virtuous human being, look at Diogenes. And there are a couple of very extended passages in the discourses that some of you might know about, where he kind of praises Diogenes at great length. So maybe Epictetus's version that suggests that we ought to kind of be suspicious of these things and to resist them is perhaps more cynic than actually stoic. Right, now, this is, I think, very closely connected to the idea, one of the key stoic virtues, right? I'm gonna, I'll I'll try and go through this fairly quickly. The key word here is sophrosgene. And sophrosgene is one of the four core stoic virtues, right? And it's the one that's usually translated as either temperance or moderation. Another way in which we might translate it is self-control, right? But as with almost every technical term in ancient Greek philosophy, it's basically untranslatable, right? I mean, when I'm teaching, this is the kind of standard refrain, right? Every single key word, eudaimonia, arete, they're all untranslatable, right? And so Frosinet is another one like that. Now, translating this key term as something like temperance or moderation might be taken to imply some kind of denial or abstinence. It's about avoiding certain things or about resisting certain things. Now, what I want to do is very quickly run through some examples of different ways in which people have tried to render this term just to give a sense of its various meanings. So this passage in particular, this is from a dictionary of philosophical Greek. This guy translated sophrones as temperate, sophrogene as temperance, right? But then he says, these are dummy translations, right? Because you can't really translate it. So temperance isn't really ideal, but it's the best that he can grab at. And he gives us some examples from Plato and Aristotle. I won't talk about those too much. What the Stoics think isn't necessarily the same as what Plato and Aristotle think about this key term. Um, Here's another one. Here, we don't hear any mention of temperance at all. Here we have self-control and moderation as the translation of this key term. An etymological meaning of moral sanity, which is quite nice. And in this passage from another dictionary of, of philosophical Greek terms, he continues after saying a bit about Plato and a bit about Aristotle, he then gets to the Stoics and he says the more intellectualizing Stoa denied the Platonic definition and defined it as knowledge of the things to be chosen and avoided, right? Now, knowledge of the things to choose and avoid is obviously quite different from moderation or temperance, right? It might be that knowing what to choose and what to avoid might cash out in a particular practical situation as resisting something, but it needn't. 
And then finally, from a recent lexicon, Cambridge Greek lexicon, the, the, the verb behind sophrosyne here, to be of sound mind, to show good sense, which might involve behaving sensibly, modestly, discreetly, to exercise self-control, right? So it's about good judgment, we might say, not moderation, let alone abstinence, right? So it's about making good choices, right? And that might involve resisting excessive desires or physical pleasures, but not necessarily, right? It might be that it involves knowing that having just one more drink might actually be a bad idea and you know you've reached your limit and it's time to stop, right? That might be exercising good judgment, but that's quite different from abstinence, which the word, a word like temperance might imply. So I think, I think Epictetus has had this big influence on, on, on quite a few people thinking about what Stoicism looks like today. But perhaps his version of, of Stoic ethics is a bit more austere, a bit more cynic, we might say, than what the Stoics really had in mind. And when we see this word sophrosyne translated as temperance or moderation, that might also seem to think that Stoicism might involve a certain amount of abstinence or self-denial. And, and I'm trying to suggest that perhaps those translations are a bit misleading. Maybe really what we need is to think about having good judgment about how we use external things, good judgment about our desires, knowing when to stop, but also knowing when it's right and proper just to enjoy these things and to enjoy life rather than falling into a kind of attitude of voluntary poverty. And that is just what I wanted to put on the table to provoke you all a bit. So thank you all very much. You can go high five, high 10 to John, just to say thank you for the presentation. Thanks for helping us figure that bit out. John, this is a, yeah, so I think this is really kind of practical, right? I mean, you took us down that technical path, but the idea is how can I live as a stoic and be, you know, if I think to myself, it's kind of fun, right? Even my kids will look at me and say, well, dad, is that virtuous? Right. And the whole point is, how can I figure out what virtue is in the moment seems to be what you're telling us that we, the Stoics really wanted us to be thinking about, right? How, do, how can I be, how can I be virtuous? Absolutely. And I mean, as it goes, I think I can try to tell a story about how these two different ideas might be reconciled, but I don't want to put that on the table just yet because I want to hear from everyone else, right? Yeah. But at the end, I'll happily kind of loop back and perhaps say a bit more about how I think we could fit these pieces together. Yeah. So let me see where I am on the clock. Okay. So questions from the audience. If you type them in the chat, I'll make sure these things get to... John as well, it, and I. If you came up with something in particular during the, how do I decide what's good? Is it okay? You know, I'm going to say, John, something that I have seen right now. There are some folks talking about this, and I get the Epictetus versus Seneca idea. Uh, I'm, I'm. Some voices inside of Stoicism now are almost saying Marcus wants you to be rich. I mean, I, I was thinking about the prosperity Stoic gospel. Was there a word for that? I don't know what that is, but it sounds like if we take these two folks, I mean, and there's a lot to unpack here, but if we take these two folks and think about it, there's something, there's something for us to contemplate and how we figure out what this is going to work out for ourselves. And that's really, I mean, I'm hoping for this to be practical, right? I mean, I want to figure out what I am going to be doing every day. Yeah, and just let me respond to one of the comments in the in the chat, right? So so Adrian sure. has written, your words sound more Epicurean than classical Stoicism. Well, I mean, ironically, the Epicureans were actually fairly a fairly austere bunch. They used to, you know, reduce their pleasures to a, a minimum. Epicurus used to live on bread and water. And if it was a really special day, he would treat himself to a bit of cheese. Um, so they also were living a fairly austere life and kind of sort of conform to the, the caricature of the, 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 the ancient philosopher wearing the rough cloak and, and then living a fairly simple life. Yeah. I mean, it may well be that one of the reasons why Stoicism was so popular amongst the Romans was perhaps that it was in fact something that didn't have a problem 
with people living a fairly normal life and pursuing these sorts of things. It was something that could appeal to the Roman elite because it wasn't about being the crusty cynic beggar on the street corner and it could accommodate a, a wider range of, of lifestyles, we might say. Yeah. The question came up here in the chat. I think you probably saw this too. Good judgment. How is good judgment versus virtue, wisdom? How, how do I, how are these different? Yeah, now that is a really good question. I mean, one of the things that the, one of the things that the Stoics are committed to is the, is what is often called the unity of virtues, which is to say that these four core virtues are basically the same thing right? Or they are expressions of the same kind of core character traits, right? So absolutely, it sounds, the way in which I was characterizing it as good judgment sounds a lot like kind of prudence, right? But also, you know, if you think about courage, courage is about making the right judgment in a certain type of situation. And justice as well is about bringing good judgment in a certain type of situa situation, right? So you could say that prudence or wisdom is good judgment. Right. You know, in, in some contexts, that will cash out as, as, as acting courageously. In other contexts, that will cash out as acting justly. And in other contexts, it will cash out as acting moderately or, or showing self-control. And they're all examples of good judgment, we might say. And the other idea the Stokes were committed to is that these come as a package, right? So it's about developing an excellent kind of character trait, which will give you all of these, right? It's an all or nothing affair. You get the set or you've got none of them. <laughs> right. So let's think about the, the question that we can send our audience to chat with each other about something that they can discuss, right? Is I think maybe having them kind of play back what this means to them and how it might pan out in a decision, right? So you gave... This, the example of, you know, it doesn't mean one more drink or not drinking at all. And I think that's great because when we see temperance, we think temperance might mean us not to drink, right? And as I say, what if that's just not practical? So in that spot, maybe it's just, you know, how do we figure out what that limit is for ourselves? If you've got any final comments or anything you want to say, John, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I mean, I wanted to come come back to to where I started on this topic. So, I mean, as, as someone mentioned earlier in the in the in the chat, that I thought was quite interesting. You know, I'm thinking about making a big purchase, and then I put my stoic hat on, and I think, do I need this luxury? And that's the kind of idea I want to challenge. Right, the idea that being a good stoic means foregoing certain things. You know, if you're if you're a real stoic and you think money is an indifferent, then then why do you want to resist spending it, right? Easy come, easy go. Just let it go out and in, enjoy what it can bring, right? And to come back to this question about, you know, moderation, self-denial, voluntary poverty versus enjoying whatever life happens to offer you at the moment. I think the way we might be able to sort of reconcile these different ideas is in the following way, right? So when Epictetus is writing, he's talking to his students, right? His students are not Stoics, right? They're trying to learn to become Stoics, but they're most definitely not, right? And in some places, he's very rude about them and says, you're all horrible Epicureans. You know nothing about really living a Stoic life, right? Now, in that context, it may be that some abstinence and self-denial might be a really important component of your training, right? If you are, you know, addicted to shopping, then you might need to engage in some abstinence, go cold turkey, in order to get those desires back under control, right? So some kind of abstinence and control might be important as you go through that training process, right? Just as if someone's a recovering alcoholic, they might indeed go into full abstinence because that's what they need to do. But once you've started to make progress, once you're kind of a real stoic, so to speak, right? Not that I'm claiming to be one of those. Right. But the kind of the genuine stoic attitude, once you've gone through that training, ought not to be to kind of forego any of those pleasures or desires. It ought to be to enjoy whatever life presents you with, right? And so that's really my kind of thinking on this at the moment, right? But with the big caveat that in six months time, I might think something slightly different because as Phil was saying earlier, we're all a work in progress here. 
Yeah, isn't that true? So I like that because I'm going to say, I don't know that I've had anybody say this to me that way. So you're kind of presenting this differently to me and I'm completely okay with it. But it, it, it to me, there's a parallel to this of, you know, for example, a lot of us will say, well, as a Stoic, I shouldn't care about this, that, or the other. And I, I might not, for example, I think it's really easy for someone, particularly when they're beginning in their Stoic journey to say, well, this means I'm not going to get active in my community, et cetera, because that's a thing I don't have control over. And that's just the, and we can see that it's the flip of that, right? That a lot of people say, no, I mean, I don't care. I should be jumping in and trying to solve problems if I can solve problems that, I mean, because that's part of my cosmopolitanism. And and I'm not trying to drag us into another spot. My point is, I think it's really easy to get this wrong. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And in, in just spending some time, I, I'm so appreciative of you kind of putting out an idea saying, well, look, we don't need to be worried about this this way. There's another way to go about it. John, did you did you see the Seneca movie when it came out? Or the- I've, not, I've not seen it yet. I don't think it's available where I am at the moment, or if it is, not anywhere I've access. I think there'll be a DVD at some point, and, and then hopefully I'll get to see it then. But it looks it it looks it looks interesting, should we say? <laughs> I think I think I'm only hoping for it to be interesting. I'm only hoping that it's going to be interesting. And here's my can I tell you my, my like one little problem with this is and it's not really a problem. This is just the way Phil's brain works. Is that now that I've seen that John Malkovich is Seneca, I find myself reading the letters to Seneca in John Malkovich's voice. And I'm like, I think this would be a lot of fun. If I, like, and it's like, you know, maybe one of these tools will allow me to go back and just have him read the letters. I mean, because you know, that was those were late in his life anyway. I mean, he's he was trying to prove something by the time he got around writing all that stuff, writing those pieces, right? And you know, that probably was the right guy. It would be John Malkovich as Seneca in that spot. Yeah, I mean, we should persuade him to do the audio book, but but these days, if not, I'm sure AI can just create it for you. <laughs> well, that's what I'm thinking, right? Someone will go through and study his voice, and then we'll just have him go off and have him do the whole thing, grab it, right? Okay. Any so, I, I thank you for the topic suggestion. Stoicism, environmentalism. I bet you we could get Chris Gill to show up for that, don't you think? Or Kai Whiting, or more more folks there's quite a thing for that so crowdfunded i don't know oh crowdfunded the book i get that yeah, yeah. john john malkovich to do that i think that would be great fun M- uh, maybe maybe karen duffy knows him i wouldn't be surprised if duff knew him so yeah. but we'll we'll reach we can we got to figure out how to make this work anyway I, i've been i haven't seen the movie yet myself i'm interested in how much fun that might be so Okay. Thanks. Uh, Anybody else have questions for us or anything we might be thinking about as we go forward with this? All right. I got lots of thank yous and lots of that. And folks just standing back going, okay, this was cool. And I'm glad to have you with that. Thank you for being here. I think with that, I'm going to call this to a close. Thank you for being here. Goodbye. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thanks, Phil.